Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Catherine Doe, a product marketing director here at Equifax for our risk portfolio. Our episode today is a compliment to our March 16th Market Pulse webinar about how credit unions are adapting to economic uncertainty. Mike Shank was one of our featured guests for that event, and he joins us again today on this platform. Mike is Deputy Chief Advocacy Officer for Policy Analysis and Chief Economist for the Credit Union National Association, or CUNA. We'll discuss the risk and opportunities that may be lying within portfolios, and we'll answer many of the questions our webinar audience submitted last month. But before we begin, let's get a brief economic update from David Fieldhouse, Director of Consumer Credit Analytics at Moody's Analytics. David? Thanks very much, Catherine. In terms of the economic update, uh, the March report stuck to script. Uh, The employment report showed that there were 236,000 jobs added in March, and the unemployment rate declined from 3.6 to 3.5%. And these job numbers follow a very strong January and February where the economy looked like it was absolutely booming. Uh, In January and February, nearly 800,000 jobs were added. Very, very strong number. The Federal Reserve actually might like to see the job market slow a bit further. However, there's something in the report that the Fed officials might be happy with, and that's March's payroll gain was actually the lowest since late 2020. In terms of the sectors, we saw professional services, healthcare, and tourism lead the way. They were responsible for about half the job gains. However, uh, there seem to be some signs that retail and the housing market are slowing. Retail employment gains contracted for the first time in three months, and construction payrolls fell for the first time since January 2022. The wage gains also were a little high, but close to what the Fed officials might actually like to see. Uh, Average hourly earnings climbed 3.8% from the fourth quarter of 2022 to the first quarter quarter of 2023. And Fed officials feel like 3.5% might be uh, reasonable uh, in this economy. So 3.8 to 3.5, we're getting close to what we'd, uh, what Fed officials might like to see. Uh, And then slowing wage growth without a lot of people losing their jobs is the perfect scenario for the Fed. We don't think the Fed is entirely done raising rates, so we think that payments will continue to rise, and this will have some implications on consumer credit market and people uh, to to the households overall. Uh, Fixed rate debt will gradually roll over, um, and it will be replaced with higher rate debt. Uh, Fortunately, consumers will have some time to work this out, and we don't think spending will be too severely impacted. Uh, And the same will be true for credit quality. Unless consumers really overextend themselves this year, the deterioration in credit quality should be gradual uh, and manageable. And we're definitely seeing that in the data, but it it, it should be manageable going forward. And I think lenders have a good sense for where the economy is at right now. The aggregate results uh, do seem to be fine right now. We're still not predicting a recession this year in our baseline. We do want to note that there will be some lower income households that will be vulnerable to some of the increases in interest rates. Um, Lower income households typically have more variable debt or debt that rolls over quickly like auto loans. They're unlikely to have a mortgage uh, and they're less likely to have a lot of savings kept from uh, all those stimulus checks that, that we received. And so lower income household stress that may not be a macroeconomic threat. We don't think it's necessarily going to cause a recession. And really that's because this population accounts for a smaller proportion of spending. Uh, however, this population may suffer and have trouble getting new debt and maintaining uh, their current spending pattern. So this is definitely something we want to watch out for this year. Thanks, Catherine. Back to you. Okay, thanks, David and Mike. Welcome. Thank you again for coming back with us today. Um, We might as well just jump right in and get started. Our webinar audience said that their top priority is to better understand the risks and opportunities in their current portfolio. Uh, So I'm curious, what advice do you have for them? um, And where should credit unions focus their resources at this particular time? That's a great question. And um, before I get into that, I just did want to make it clear that our outlook at CUNA roughly aligns with the Moody's outlook, which I think is really important because 
We do feel like the Federal Reserve has engaged to a pretty significant ex extent. More than a million and a half people will be put out of work if the Fed has its way. The unemployment rate will drift up from about 3.6% today to over 4.5% in our estimation. So the environment is tough and it's, I think the challenges are compounded both by what happened with Silicon Valley Bank and uh, potentially with what may happen with the both the debt ceiling and the budget situation and the prospect for a significant fight in that arena. The effect of that from a rate perspective is estimated to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 125 basis points higher, which could be pretty impactful and again is substantially more impactful than what the Fed has cooked into its baseline forecast. So that's a big deal. I should also mention that credit unions are unique in the marketplace, not for profit, and they're member owned and democratically controlled. And that's really important. We talk about it all the time, but we don't really talk about what that difference is when the rubber hits the road a lot. But it's especially important during economic disparity, or economic dislocations and challenges. In the for profit sector, banks and other financial services companies have an obligation, actually an, a legal obligation, a fiduciary obligation to protect share, shareholder value. And that means in an uncertain environment on the margin, those for-profit institutions are more likely to turn people away who might cause an erosion in that shareholder value. On the, on the other side of the coin, credit unions, because we're member owned and we're focused on our members, not maximizing profits, but maximizing service to members, we enter those situations, and actually our CEO likes to, to call credit unions financial uh, first responders. And the reason is, in these situations, it's just in our DNA to interact with people and to try to get them through difficulties sooner than they otherwise would, through those thoughtful conversations and through the extension of help even though it might be a little bit riskier to, uh, to interact with people. So that's kind of the cool superpower that credit unions have. And so I would say, just do what you've done in the past during difficult times. Continue to have those conversations, continue to serve people. Gotta be a little bit more careful, there's no question about that. But the idea of turning a lot of people away simply because you wanna protect capital is not what we're all about. And, and every credit union director, I think, needs a reminder of that uh, as we go into these tough situations. It's not a super comfortable feeling to watch capital erode, but that's why we were chartered. We were chartered during the Great Depression to help people get through. And so we use capital during tough times by embracing people who are turned away elsewhere. That, that's the big opportunity and actually, I've lived through probably three or four big crises, starting with the savings and loan crisis in the 1980s. And at the tail end of every one of those crises, we see really strong membership growth at credit unions because credit union members appreciate the way they're treated in these environments. They tell their friends about credit unions and more people join credit unions on the tail end of, of these big uh, dislocations. I think that's the opportunity. In terms of the challenges, you know, I would say the canary in the coal mine, at least from my perspective, is uh, what's happening with credit cards. And that's part of the reason that we've purchased the Equifax database. We've purchased a 10% sample, so we have, uh, I think it goes back to 2005. So we have 28 billion records and I think 2 billion new records every year. Uh, and so we can see behaviors in the marketplace and we can differentiate between credit union members and non-members. And we can see in the data that credit union members are, are really more resilient than non-members for a variety of reasons. But the first place I look is credit card portfolio. So I'm looking for the, the volume of, of business, that you know, how, how are those portfolios growing and whether the growth is it's completely new growth, like balances that, have, balances that have gone from zero to some other significant number or if it's revolvers that are just adding to that pile of debt that they already have. But that's, that's in terms of potential hiccups, uh, that's my starting point. And I do wanna see, you know, 
how are the transactors behaving? Are they still transactors or are they becoming revolvers? And I want to look at that uh, across the credit spectrum. And I'm especially, of course, concerned with those on the, the bottom rungs of the credit spectrum. Mm, and so y- you consider credit card to be the first place to look because, uh, you know, literally in a consumer's wallet, that's the first thing they'll grab if, if they're struggling in other areas. Is Am I connecting those dots? Absolutely. Yeah. The, the more likely it is that somebody is having a tough time paying their bills, the more likely that they're going to be accessing that uh, particular product. Gotcha. Thank you. And I appreciate your, your reminder um, and the distinction between credit unions and other types of financial institutions. Uh, I started my career in credit unions, so it's, it's always nice to have conversations like that and um, a reminder on how they were charted and why. Switching gears just a little bit, maybe you can tell us um, some more about the latest trends within credit union operations and what you're seeing in terms of financial performance right now. Actually, let me just make one comment about from the economic perspective. Start with the economics and then I'll go to the credit union, uh, credit union economics, essentially. So one of the really interesting things about the environment we're in today, where we're expecting a, a, a pretty significant slowdown, mild in the grand scheme of things, but, you know, noticeable for a lot of people. One of the interesting things is that the starting place for most consumers today is unlike the starting place in previous economic downturns. So at the moment, for example, in general, on average in the consumer sector, people don't have much in the way of debt. We have been in a general household deleveraging event since the Great Recession, since the financial crisis in 2008. In 2007, the dollar amount of debt in the household sector as a percentage of take-home pay was 125%. And that has come down steadily over time, and it's now about 90%. And that so that is a level that was obvious pre-pandemic, and it's equal to where it was, I think, back in 1990. So it's substantially lower pile of debt relative to income. More importantly, perhaps, Federal Reserve tracks the debt payment burden. So this is the monthly obligation that people have that they've embraced as they've taken on debt as a percentage of take-home pay. So how much of their take-home pay is used to satisfy debt obligations? And what those data points are showing us today is that the number has never been lower. It was a substantial and very important event when rates were very close to zero and millions and millions of consumers refinanced their mortgages and folded in a lot of the high rate debt that they had outstanding into those refinanced mortgages that were by and large originated at at about 3% on a 30 year uh, fixed rate, right? So uh, if you look at the Federal Reserve data and they've been looking at this, tracking it since 1980, if you look at that data, the current reading on that, at least the last one I looked at, uh, is the lowest it's ever been. Uh, abstracting from the COVID crisis. There was a, a big blip down during the COVID crisis because of the $7 trillion in fiscal assistance. So like, incomes went up a lot. And so the denominator effect caused, the, caused that ratio to go down even lower than it is today. But abstracting from the, you know, the middle of the COVID crisis, the reading today is lower than any reading that we saw pre-COVID all the way back to 1980. So that's great. I mean, uh, I think, and, and net worth, if you look at net worth, so the, not just the debt, but assets, uh, the net worth overall at the moment in the household sector is about uh, approaching eight times annual household income. And that that's not a record, but it's very, very close to a record level. So consumers are in great shape. And so, uh, uh, it, by extension, uh, credit unions actually are in great shape as well. Uh, our, our balance sheets are solid and we're earning at high rates. ROA, net income as a percentage of average assets for credit unions in 2022 was 88 basis points, so just a little bit less than 1% ROA. Uh, that's a solid reading from a historical perspective. And uh, from a balance sheet perspective, our net worth ratios collectively, 10.7%. Our regulator says, 7% is equal to well-capitalized. So our capital buffers are quite large. 
That's net worth. That's, so that's the reserves and undivided earnings, essentially. When you take into account unrealized losses in portfolios, because you know that was a big deal with Silicon Valley Bank, for example, all financial institutions do have uh, some uh, unrealized losses because all financial institutions have fixed income portfolios. We adjust for those and we look at the equity capital ratio. It's very close to 9%. So that's a two percentage point buffer over uh, what the the uh, regulators consider to be uh, well capitalized. Getting back to the consumer sector, uh, because of what I described earlier, our asset quality statistics are near all-time lows. Now, both delinquencies and net charge-offs have been coming up a little bit, but uh, they're below long-run averages, and they're not rising to the level that we would typically see prior to the beginning of an economic downturn. Uh, They're actually quite low. For example, uh, the delinquency rate in the, at the end of 2022 came in at uh, 61 basis points, 0.61%, and the net charge-off rate was 0.34%. And, and what that means is that 99.7% of credit union members are paying their loans back. You know, by those really key measures, I think we're in good shape. We've got a lot of liquidity in the system, a lot of access to liquidity. Uh, cash and cash equivalents are over 10%, uh, very, very close to pre-pandemic levels. You know, from what we can tell, there's been a bit of an increase in longer-term assets, but not substantial. And so the interest rate uh, uh, risk exposures seem to be about where they were pre-pandemic. So, Mike, you, you mentioned the, the recent Silicon Valley Bank issue, we'll call it. Um, what, if any, uh, implications are there for credit unions related to bank failures? And what, what advice might you give to members or, or those running credit unions? Well, I think a couple things. One, uh, just my starting point is similar to what I was saying earlier. Credit unions really are different in the marketplace, and it shows up over time. For example, uh, the FDIC has operated in the red on two separate occasions, each time for two consecutive years, as uh, the, the you know banks got into trouble. As you know, there was an insurance fund that uh, supported the savings and loan industry in the 1980s. That went completely bankrupt, doesn't exist anymore. If you look at credit unions over the last 30 years, our insurance fund has been funded at $1.30 per hundred in insured savings over that entire period of time, $1.20 or higher over that uh, entire period of time. So it really does reflect an industry that not only stays engaged, but does so in, in a careful manner. The research that we have, we've done quite a bit of academic research on this topic. And again, structure matters and incentives matter. And what we know is that in the for-profit sector, not just CEO compensation, but executive compensation tends to be tilted more dramatically towards high powered compensation, which means variable pay for performance. And when you have that type of an incentive structure, you're more likely to be swinging for the fences. So that doesn't happen at credit unions because of the different incentive structure. And the fact that, you know, our credit union members are our owners. So we're very careful about not doing bad things to our members. So those things are really, really impactful. Other than that, there's some other structural things that come into play. So for example, if you were to look at the average amount of insured deposits at a credit union, the average is about $7,000. At banks, collectively, I believe the average is about $14,000. Now, you know, FDIC insurance, federal insurance for both credit unions and banks is $250,000. So those are quite, those readings are quite low. If you though look at, for example, uh, regional banks, the number is much closer to $170,000 on average. So that's getting you pretty close, the average, pretty close to that 250 max. SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, was at $1.25 million. And they actually had a depositor that had uh, self-reported a deposit of $3 billion. That greatly exceeds the $250,000 uh, insurance limit, right? As it turns out, 
the Silicon Valley Bank had uh, 95% of its deposits uninsured. It's, it's basically the exact opposite within credit unions. 93%, mm. 92 or 93% of credit union deposits are fully insured by the federal government. And so oh. when depositors at Silicon Valley Bank mm -hmm. uh, saw this situation, mm -hmm. they wanted their money out and they wanted it now. That's, that's what essentially what caused the, the problem. That in combination with substantial unrealized losses in their investment portfolio, which made it difficult for them to liquidate assets to pay those depos uh, depositors who wanted their money. Completely opposite situation in credit union land, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not gonna affect us. It's gonna affect us. And uh, the effect is, the, I think, maybe two or threefold. One, more than likely, we're gonna see increasing regulation and supervision on especially those two things that I just talked about, insured deposits and uh, unrealized losses, liquidity generally. I'm a director at a $6 billion credit union. Every year at the beginning of the year, I get a letter from our regulator. And the, reg uh, the letter basically says, here are our, super our supervisory priorities for the year. And near the top of that list coming in to this year was liquidity. So everybody knew that this was gonna be a big deal. I feel like it's gonna be a bigger deal now if you know for any institution that has not been supervised since the SVB uh, uh, situation. Supervisory authorities, we can be really, really careful about looking at uh, exposures mm -hmm. like the exposures that I just talked about. So that's one thing. Secondly, I think that, um, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen with deposit insurance generally, but as you know, there are a lot of different suggestions out there. You know, should the number be $500,000, not 250? Should people have access to different types of funds? That's all going to be examined. So there's a possibility that, like it or not, credit unions will be sort of pulled into a, a, a depository insurance scheme where we're going to pay more money for insurance, even though we probably don't need a heck of a lot more insurance. And so there could be costs associated with that. And I'm, I'm obviously very concerned about that. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, and I alluded to this earlier, is that there is, because of uh, SVB, sort of a, an economic impact in that access and availability of credit is going to be a lot lower post-crisis than pre-crisis. And as I alluded to, some of the experts that have looked at this think that that, uh, that sort of from an interest rate perspective, the equivalence would be uh, that the SVB uh, situation resulted in maybe a 75 basis point increase in short-term rates or the equivalent mm -hmm. of that in terms of access mm -hmm. to credit. So uh, yeah, it's regulatory and supervisory. It's bottom line uh, impacts and it's more than likely going to make it more difficult for, for people to get, get access to credit. So let, let's go back to, you mentioned uh, job loss, job market, what may be headed our way. Do you see that the job market will return to um, quote unquote normal, a minimum wage scenario, or will an increasing number of small businesses potentially be forced to close doors? Uh, I mean, I don't think it has to be either or. I don't think it's going to go back to normal, but, and, and I do recognize that for a lot of smaller businesses, access uh, to labor is a significant issue and especially uh, affordable labor, right? It's, it's difficult. I think what it's going to mean for a lot of small businesses is that they're actually going to have to bite the bullet and pass those costs along to their customers, which is not an easy thing to do, not something that most small businesses get excited about. But I guess, you know, if you're looking for a silver lining, everybody's pretty much in the same boat. So I think that you'll see more and more businesses um, using that before they, you know, essentially decide to shutter their businesses. And so again, on the, the small business perspective, any pointers you may have uh, in credit scoring in, in this economy, such as unsecured credit or losses projected for small businesses? Well, I, again, I think the good news is that if we're right, this more than likely will be a mild recession. So it won't look like the previous several that we've been through. And that should be really helpful. And I think, on the, again, on the margin, I think what that means is that business owners should think in terms of, you're not going to have to do what you did in the past to, to muddle through. 
it'll be easier to remain engaged with a greater number of people, a wider variety of people from a credit score perspective. Doing that will have payoffs. Credit unions have experienced that all along throughout their history, uh, which started, you know, about 100 years ago. Small businesses are in a better position in this downturn than in previous. They will find it difficult, small businesses will, I think, find it more difficult than their counterparts who are larger to themselves get access in the in this environment to credit. We, are, we already see that in the um, senior loan officer, officer surveys that the Federal Reserve does. Banks are tightening and they're tightening especially noticeably for smaller uh, businesses. So that will be a challenge. There's no question about it. And so maybe we'll end on, um, which is always one of my favorite questions. You've given us a lot of great information here this afternoon. What are you not being asked um, in any of your engagements? Or what are you not talking about enough, you think, that perhaps credit union leadership should be thinking about more? What would you advise them to not overlook? Organizations with purpose uh, really do stand out in the marketplace. The credit unions have a distinct mission. It's actually in our chartering documents, it appears in the Federal Credit Union Act. And, and it basically says that credit unions were chartered to uh, provide credit for provident and productive purposes and to encourage thrift, especially to those of modest means. So that's our mission. And that's a good starting point. It really does set us apart from a lot of other institutions, but it's not enough. Uh, you really need to have, so the, the, the mission actually has to do with who you serve and how, and your purpose really is around the difference that you make in the world. I think one of the weaknesses that credit unions have is they take the incredible things that they do, maybe not with a grain of salt, but they don't recognize that those things are unusual in the marketplace and that they're really, really impactful and they don't spend enough time bragging about those things, measuring them, and then talking about them, uh, not only with potential members, but with policymakers and with the press. One of the reasons actually that we've invested in the Equifax database is to show, as I mentioned earlier, behaviors in the marketplace and how those behaviors differ between various groups of, of consumers we especially want to shine a light on credit union members and then use that to build out a narrative that we can use on a national basis to um, to really celebrate that difference. Well, that, that's a great way to end. And uh, I hope that our team is able to support you in what sounds like a really important and worthy goal and mission. Thanks again, Mike. Um, if our audience would like to follow up with you or learn more about CUNA, um, how would you suggest they do that? Yeah, uh, so the best way is to email uh, custat, C-U-S-T-A-T, at CUNA, C-U-N-A dot co-op. And then um, everybody in my group will see it and we'll do triage on on the questions and even if I'm in an airplane, somebody <laughs> will get back to those people. Awesome. That's really kind of you, Mike. We appreciate it. For our listeners, if you enjoyed today's episode, please share with your colleagues and consider subscribing to our podcast. If you'd like to send us and our Equifax team any suggested topics or questions, uh, please email us at marketpulsepodcast at equifax.com. And don't forget to register for our Market Pulse webinar series. You can do that at equifax.com forward slash Market Pulse. You can also listen to previous uh, installments of that webinar series, including the one we had Mike as our guest for last month in March. Um, also associated with Market Pulse, we provide exclusive economic and credit insights to help your business make more confident decisions. So I hope you'll uh, visit our site to get more of that. And thank you all for listening and join us next time. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com.